He's Dave, and I'm Dallas, and we have opinions on just about everything. Sometimes they're on point, and sometimes they go down better with a glass of wine. Join us. This is the Wine and Podcast. Welcome back, everybody, to Wine and the show where we pair wine with movies, TV, music, books, and comics. We deep dive into each piece of entertainment slash art that we and or our guests select. And then, yes, we literally pair wines with the work at the end of each episode and tell you our reasoning behind each pairing. I just wanted to state that out front because a couple of people, I think, were surprised when they're like, oh, you literally pair wine with this stuff? And it's like, yes, that is the point of the show. Um, and hopefully when we do that, we offer for a little bit of wine education to go along with it because wine is a complicated Mm -hmm. thing and every little bit of info helps us navigate that world and offers an on-ramp if we're new or new-ish or even if you're not, even if you've been a wine nerd a long time, you always need more information, uh, more of an on-ramp into the corners and sections of wine that you are less familiar with than others. Um, Now, most of the time, the entertainment that we discuss on this show are things we love or at least very much like, but sometimes we may dissect something that we hate in a constructive manner, see if we can find the reason for that quote-unquote hate, maybe find elements that we can admire anyway, but whatever it is you love, whatever it is you hate, there is a wine that pairs with that. All right. So if you like what you hear, please make sure to hit that follow or subscribe button. It does help the podcast grow and reach new listeners. And if you love us, please leave a five star review. And if you don't love us, just send us a message. No review. Forget the review. That's a bad idea. You don't you don't need to. This ain't Yelp. But send us a nice, constructive email. You can send us an email at wine. The letter N is in Nancy. P.O.D. Pod is in podcast wine and pod at gmail.com you can also find uncut lengthier versions of these episodes along with articles on the intersection between entertainment and wine interactive polls bonus pairings and more on our substack wine and dot substack dot com uh, and if you're on your phone, you can also send us a text, quote unquote. You'll find a clickable link at the beginning of the description of this episode. It doesn't work as an active link on every platform, but it does on most. Click that little phrase. It opens up your text app and you can send us a direct message via that. That shows up in our Buzzsprout inbox and does not show us your full phone number. Never fear. It only shows us your final four digits, kind of like how a credit card shows up on a receipt. It's a right here, right now, quick and easy way to send us a quick note. Uh, we we actually got our very first one from John W., an old <laughs> listener on our legacy show, The Wine and Comics Pairing Show. And he was like, woo, this is the wave of the future. A text. <laughs> Amazing. So thank you for that, John. You were the first to uh, give that a try. The first who wasn't me to test that out to see what it looked like to send us a message. Um, so, yes, a wave of the future. Mm-hmm. Send us a text directly from your phone. Mm-hmm. So, folks. Today, we are returning to Severance Season 1. In our previous episodes, we discussed the history and making of the show, then Episodes 1 through 3, and today we'll be discussing Episodes 4 through 6, the middle third of the season. Please make sure to check out those uh, previous episodes, uh, as we will not be recapping what we've already discussed. I will simply say, as a very brief overview, Severance is created by writer Dan Erickson, produced and developed by uh, Ben Stiller and his production company Red Hour. The first three episodes were directed by Stiller and the first two episodes fully written by Erickson. Episodes four through six now are the first episodes not directed by Stiller, but by the only additional director on season one, Efi McArdle. Nope, I pronounced that wrong. It is Efa McArdle. A-O-I-F-E. I really am illiterate when it comes to Irish names, but someone on YouTube corrected us after part one of this five-part miniseries. So it is Efa McArdle. Please ignore all the Efees that I say as we go. Thank you very much. Back to our scheduled programming. Severin stars Zach Cherry, Britt Lauer, Trammell Tillman, Jen Tullock, Deachin Lockman, Michael Chernus, John Turturro, Christopher Walken, and Patricia motherfucking goddess Arquette, <laughs> and of course, Adam Scott in the lead role. All right. So... One thing I did want to say before we start talking about these three episodes, Dallas, Mm. is that super interestingly, I did note that the so these are a different writer for every episode, Mm. episode four, five and six, each have a different writer. And they're all women, which I thought was 
unique and curious. Like, I was like, ooh, good on you, uh, Red Hour and Ben Stiller and whoever was hiring these people. I'm assuming it was them. Um, like, good good on you for having that. Because Dan Erickson wrote episodes one and two. Right. Um, a, a man wrote, I'm going to already forget his name, but we talked about him on episode three. Mm -hmm. uh, Andrew, Colville. somebody wrote episode three, right? Yep. Um, and the fact that he then has three women and episode seven, also written by a woman, and then eight and nine, once again, by men. So that's a really good mix right there. It I mean, is. That was, that was well divided. And it makes sense for episodes four through six because we get really deep into Helly's uh, sort of nightmare, for lack of a better term. Yes. And, yes. Uh, and but, the nursing center. And the nursing center. So, um, so yeah. 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 Yeah, there was a lot of, uh, and when I say the nursing center, it's not it's not a nursing center exactly, is it? It's a, a birthing center, birthing center more. So, center. yeah, right, right. It's where pregnant women go to have the baby and have nursemaids attend to them. And well, we're going to get into all of that when we talk about the episodes. But um, but let's just say this was very female POV centric. Mm -hmm. These episodes, yeah. um, a lot of content I probably required folks who writers who had a better pov yeah, exactly. than the <laughs> right right watching from the sidelines like right. like all the male writers would have um so all right let's talk about episode four yeah. the you you are yeah. uh which is the both the title of the episode and it's the title of a book uh -huh. in the episode the book was written by adam scott uh and adam scott's character's name is mark, mark. so let's call him mark yeah. Um, so it's Mark's brother-in-law, mm -hmm. who is a writer and a a real. He's a fun character. He's a real floof of, of a character. He's that a mysterious is, character um, too, because you he is, every yeah. time every time he has some sort of absent-minded, sort of foppish kind of moment, there's always a, a an odd dissonance afterwards, which you know makes you think there's some darkness or some other turn of character that's going to happen in the future. So I'm actually excited to see how this character plays out. For those of you who don't remember or don't know, uh, Mark's brother-in-law seems to be engaged in some anti-Lumen sort of uh, behavior. Um, he's written a book, or at least anti-severance uh, yeah. uh, behavior. Well um, he's calling well, he, into question the morality and ethics. Um, he's kind of anti-corporate, right? Yeah. He's anti-capitalism, sort of. Like, yeah, I'm not hugely so. He's not anarchist. He's right. not like down with everything. But philosophically, and his books tend to be this weird hybrid. Uh, well, it's, they're kind of like self-help guides, right. Right? right? And they're self-help guides that are all about be true to yourself right. and don't you know your job does not define you and the right. workplace is not the reason for living and corporate you the corporations need you more than you need yeah. them right which is of course true which is one of the hardest and stickiest parts about capitalist society That's is right. that yeah the bosses do need us more than we need them and yet we've set it up to where they have the out lion's share of the power and the leverage um, so it's that, and that's one of the, re the quandaries we're stuck in, in modern capitalism. Right. 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 Yeah. Um, but that said, I don't, I have not noticed, uh, and maybe I, I've, you know, I've, this is a rewatch for me. So I've been trying to pay really close attention mm. to like the details. Cause I already know the broad strokes of the plot going in this time. Um, and I was trying to really pay attention to like, what, who is this guy? And I don't know how anti Lumen specifically is. I think Lumen is against the things he says um, because that's very against their philosophy, obviously. Um, but because Lumen seems to be very much about, you know, they do worship a leader. They do mm -hmm. worship a founder, right? Um, and we're we're gonna find out when we talk about these most recent episodes that there's a there is some serious like literal worship going on um, on this front, and of course Mark's brother is all about don't worship anything, like you know be just be true to yourself, find your way, find your inner peace, all these right. fun things, but like that idea of worshiping a third party is not something I think he could ever recognize or, or think was the best way for humanity mm. or the best way for even, you know, individuals to, to thrive and mm -hmm. be happy. All right. So, um, the UUR 
this is a story. <laughs> what first? My first thought, my first note that I wrote down. Uh, and once again, folks, uh, we're not. This is not a spoiler-free um, show on on this series. So if you have not watched Severance season one and you have not watched episodes four through six, go watch them first. Then come listen to the discussion <laughs> because I cannot promise that I'm that I'm not going to uh, give anything away. So my first note I wrote down, and this is something that. Um, I wrote, how is Milchik not feeling it too when he's in the break room with Helly R and we're watching them break her slowly because she has to repeat this uh, written down statement over and over right. again until they say she means it. And she winds up, she mentions it later that she wound up repeating it 1,072 times. Right. <laughs> right? And the thing that killed me or the thing that made it really like question marky in my head was Milchik is unfazed. Right. Having to listen and sit there to her do it 1072 times. And I'm like, that would break me. <laughs> I didn't, I wouldn't have to be the one to say it. I would still be, I'd be losing my mind and my wherewithal if I had to watch someone say it right. one, and, and every time be like, I, I'm afraid you still don't mean it again, yeah. you know, kind of thing. So either he takes a perverse pleasure in this where it's just like, this is something that like fuels him and he loves it, which doesn't really come across that way per se. Mm. Um, or this is where we, we compared Lumen to Scientology the last time. And I do think there is a true believer element to something going on here. Um, but the fact that Milchik is fully primed, he's ineffective, he's ready to go again the moment. So they even had to break that day and send her back up yeah. so her Audi could go, you know, sleep to go, go to sleep and then come back the next day. And they started right back up again. So, of course, her any there almost no time has passed right. um, because she goes up the elevator, comes back. She slept. But again, from her POV, there was no time right. that has elapsed. So she had to go right back to it. Um, but again, Milchek is just like, uh-huh. I think, like, for, let's go. I think for Milchek, in terms of the character arc, I think, at least from this vantage point, what they're doing is setting up some uh, dips and turns for Milchek's character in the future. Because there have been a few times in the first three episodes where based on his gaze, based on sort of the an empathetic moment in his gaze, or even sympathetic moment in his gaze, um, clearly there's some more, there's some backstory there that we're going to, we're going to definitely unearth as we get into it. But I, I do agree. It's, um, it's, it's either one of those two things, either he's just, you know, he's, he's drank the Kool-Aid. He's, he's, he enjoys the Kool-Aid. Uh, he is truly devoted. Um, he is deeply brainwashed in his own way. Um, uh, or there is some other kind of perverse, um, sort of mechanism at play. I will say, uh, Milchek is one of the more interesting characters in this, mostly because they've done a damn good job of hiding his motivation completely. Yes. You know, he yes. is purely, uh, I think, an avatar for the corporate kind of shill. Um, because remember, mm -hmm. at least for me, this, this whole world is the sort of personification of someone's version of hell. Um, and it's sort of corporate hell. And, mm -hmm. you know, I'm, you know, I've got a couple of theories, which we'll probably get into later on in the okay. later episodes. Uh, but uh, I do think he's probably going to be a very significant character uh, the more we move into this world. Um, you know, they do such a great job of making you, making it difficult to dislike him. Actually, it's ex yes. it's very difficult to dislike that character, even though that character is essentially the harbinger. Like he is just <laughs> anytime he shows up, there's either some punishment or some weird moment that you're going to mm -hmm. have to just sort of mm -hmm. just live in. So um, I'm, I'm and, actually and quite excited point, about that character. Yeah, and to and what you said, where he's the face of the company, and and mm -hmm. literally, like when he shows up, he's either smiling because yeah. the company's happy with you, yeah. or he's frowning exactly. And giving you that stern gaze because the company's upset at you. Exactly. And he is almost literally an extension of what the company is supposed to feel about what you're doing. Yeah. And I think that's the thing. He is he's so automatonish mm. in that regard. Where and again, un unblinking, unswerving, un 
um, um, what's the unflag, uh, unflagging? What's the word I'm looking for? This is a better word. Unflinching <laughs> on, um, uh... like he never winds down. He never lacks. Oh, unwavering. He's never it's un, unwavering. unwavering. Yeah. 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 So unwavering. Mm-hmm. I mean, just you, you never get the sense that this wears on him, even a tiny, tiny yeah. bit. Um, he shows up. And as far as we know, he doesn't have an innie and an Audi, right. right? You know, there's nothing. So he's this all the time. And as we'll find out in one of the next episodes we're about to talk about, um, he even continues this outside of the workplace yeah. sometimes and uh, unwavering yeah. just uh, and unflagging. Like he never mm-hmm. there's never a lack of energy to do everything he needs to do. And unlike Patricia Arquette's uh, Cobell, yeah. who has a lot more. She's a little at odds with the board, with the higher ups like she there's some tension there and she has other things she wants to be and do and ways that she thinks. And Milchik does not seem to have that independent side to him right. at all. He right. is just the company. He is just the company. He is a pure at this point. He's a pure avatar for the company kind of uh, persona. And uh, it, with Cobell, even. You know, we don't know if she has an Innie or an Audi. We, we actually don't. We know that her personality transfers through both worlds, but we don't know if, you know, one is a sort of a version of the other. Like, I'm, I'm still, I'm, I'm, I'm really excited about this fucking show, and I don't like them excited about it. Anyway, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I, I will say, um, in contrast to Cobell, Milchik is just so, as you said, stay steady and s- stern and unwavering. Um, Cobell is so hyper emotional and hyper reactive, and it's almost as if she can't control her emotions right, right, in these moments. Right. Particularly, and she puts on with, this. She puts on this overbearing act precisely. of being chilly and cold but almost to the point where you're like this is a little heavy honey (laughs) like you're like you're protesting too much that you're like i don't care and it's like "Eh," but you have to act like that every time you speak so it's like you really care about everything so anyway she really cares you know and uh you know the the sort of opposition to the board is an interesting dynamic because uh, one thing if you guys watch the show she has and i forget the character's name but it's the hr person who speaks for the board. Uh, So the board is never actually seen, the uh, the guys. We we do not actually see the board. Or heard. Or or heard. Or heard. heard. Right. Well, well, we do hear them once. We hear them once in episodes. Sort of. You hear a garble. You hear a garble, right? It's not actually words. Um, You hear this thing that's almost like radio static. Right. right. It's a very analog kind of radio static kind of situation. But the the board But everyone seems to be able to hear words when they hear that, right? Yeah. So so everyone in the world hears words when they hear it. It's sort of like... um, Charlie Brown's uh, uh, teacher. It's decoded in transmission somehow that we don't get. But they have this uh, female character who acts as sort of a, a HR, and she delivers the heavy information. And so there's this great scene. I'm not going to give it too much away. Where uh, at Cobell, who's our manager, I suppose. Uh, uh, she gets some news from the board uh, that they are very unhappy with her. And it's this great scene where uh, Cobell played by, um, uh, what's her name again? Uh, 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 Patricia, Arquette. Patricia Arquette. Just fantastic in this role. But you see her steely kind of uh, facade and exterior kind of just melt into this, Fear, and she does it with a just pure and abject fear. She does it with one single like look, and when they're delivering this news, and it just it was so masterful because it's a tight shot on her face, and she has one of the most interesting faces on television or film ever, uh, and it just uh, yeah, she's fantastic. Anyway, um, if you haven't watched it, go watch it. Uh, yes, yes. Um, one other thing, so we see the map that pd drew for mark of of the workspace right right um so uh a couple things that i wrote down here um for the map and i'm sure we're gonna find out a lot about uh, these things as we go yeah. or what how true this map is how true it isn't um but a few things that mark down and even though i've seen this show before like the fine details do elude me i don't remember yes, where yeah, yeah, exactly yeah. this goes so 
Um, no, I, PD has question marks by where optics and dev is. And that's the play. That's the department that Christopher Walken works in. Wow. So he's like, mm, not sure, but maybe. Um, then he has a place marked coil dot, dot, dot of doom question mark. <laughs> and I was like, whoa. And it's right by the perpetuity ring. <laughs> right. Um, right. And then there is this room that has in all caps mind and then like a chip symbol. So like the mind chip, mm -hmm. uh, the thing that's inside their head, probably. So like a room that controls that maybe. And then some people, they have, and then they have these little like houses or townhouses off to the side drawn on the map. And it says some people might live here. And I then wrote down Milchik and Cobell. Is that yeah. where yeah. they're living? Like what? And what is that place? We're not sure. And how is it off to the side? We're not sure. Um, but the map is a curious little artifact yeah. when you when you look at it and read it. And it hints at a lot of things to come. I, I'm, I'm positive it hints at a lot of things to come, even though I don't remember exactly how they come back into play. Um, and then, of course, one thing that this episode starts to really drive home is that apparently there is because this is the episode where they do visit the perpetuity wing or did they visit the perpetuity wing wing in episode three i'm already forgetting a little bit <laughs> yeah in perpetuity that was episode three that was so great, they've already right. uh yeah so they've been in the perpetuity wing so one thing that's mentioned in this episode again is that kier's original vision i think it's irv irv is usually yes. played by john Turturro. he's usually the one that can quote all this the quote right. unquote scripture right. we're gonna call it that right. um even though it's just like the handbook right. uh, i think is what they call it in the show um and he's like, Kira's original vision was all departments working together. Right. But then there was some sort of bloody coup from the optics and design department, which is the one that Christopher <laughs> yeah. Walken. So uh, the other departments distrust the optics and design department, or so we think. Right. Hold that in mind as we get to episodes five and exactly. six here. Um, and then he also mentions that that was uh, from the Cure first edition. <laughs> so they mentioned there was a first edition, mm -hmm. which means it's changed mm -hmm. over time, right? Mm -hmm. Like they keep adapting the handbook. Okay. So is any of this what Kira actually meant to do anymore? Right. Or like most religions, has it been adapted by the church, yeah. the, organ the organization to become whatever the fuck they want right. it to become, to do whatever they want to do? And this book is not what that original... Right. It's a, do manuscript it's a doctrine was, or original of original concept. intent, you know. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Um, and the other thing, and this is something, this is one of my pet theories about something that's going on here. Um, but they mention uh, Kier has a quote, 10 centuries demised, yeah. I speak on. Right. And we saw in the perpetuity wing all the many, many Egans, because it's Kier Egan. Uh -huh. and that's the family line. And there's all these Egans that have come and gone and da, da, da. There is a part of me that's starting to wonder if all of this isn't a little bit of a get out yeah. scenario um, in terms of the Egan's living on in other bodies hmm. and that maybe they are still around and they're not they have not all like, you know, the reason they haven't perpetu in perpetuity, the perpetuity wing where they show how they're all long gone and all these old Egan's are no longer with yeah. us anymore is almost trying to hammer home that no, 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 they're not with us anymore. And I'm like, are they not, though? Yeah. And maybe something about the severance is a piece of how you can divide a brain from the egg like, bag. I think it's, there I, you go. Yes, there you go. Yes. That's my, one, of my That's one of my theories as okay. well. That's one of my theories. Okay. Okay. And I'm not going to say any more about that. Like, if you haven't watched Get Out and you're yeah. not sure what we're talking about, for fuck's okay. sake, go Just watch, watch it. that. And, and then, then come back to this. Right. Then you'll know what we're talking about, yeah. but I'm not, I'm not going to ruin Get Out for you, too. You got to go. You got to go watch that on your own. Okay. Episode five. The Grim Barbarity of Optics and Design. Great, great title. Just uh, great, great title. Yes. It's also, um, yes. uh, so one thing you guys will notice if you're watching this show is that the, there's, <laughs> this is funny to me because um, having gone in a number of corporate uh, headquarters in the past few years, having visited, uh, they do this thing, lots of corporations, the multi-billion dollar corporations, uh, they collect art and it's on display in their corporate offices many times. Um, and they spend a great deal of effort, a great deal of money acquiring really good and interesting art. And uh, a recurring kind of theme in this throughout the office space is the art that's on the walls. Now, um, Christopher Walken's character is sort of responsible 
for maintaining some of the art. And uh, Irving, who is John Turturro's character, is, of course, fascinated with the art. He knows everything about it. So what you end up having is this sort of really interesting kind of adhesive between these two characters. That's all I'll say uh, about that. But um, the art is kind of epic, kind of... uh, um, renaissance in a way it's uh it's it's these sort of big battle scenes sometimes you see on the walls as they're walking by um and it, it is beautiful i mean it's some of it's just actually you just sort of i know it's just made for production but it's just beautiful so yes um it yes. it stands in stark uh, opposition to how austere the actual uh walls and setting of the office uh 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 is yes. or are so because they're very colorful the exactly art is they always very drenched in color saturation um, absolutely saturation mm-hmm. um some of it very peaceful some of it not so yeah. um one thing we learn here so the grim barbarity of optics and design is the name of one of the yeah, art pieces exactly. that we discover in the show and uh and that is a picture depicting the coup that optics and design <laughs> right. the bloody coup the bloody coup that optics and design did <laughs> Now, we also, unfo- the, the trick is, and here's a spoiler. So again, go watch these episodes. I'm going to say this the last time I'm saying there are spoilers here. So the spoiler, we then find out there is another version of this exact same picture where uh, Mark and our main characters department, the macro data refinement, <laughs> has their own bloody coup that right. apparently happened in the past. So now optics and design don't trust them because right. they've been told they were the ones that rose up and were were violent and can't right. be trusted. So this is plainly, obviously, um, a trick where every department has been given a mythology yeah, exactly. that gives them a reason not to interact or to be even be curious about the other departments. You don't want to go find them. You don't want to go talk to them. They could be violent. There could be something going on there. Um, and of course, because these people are blank slates in terms of memory, they buy into these things right. much more readily. Um, because they're kind of, and uh, that's something that you have to squint a little bit mentally to buy into the concept because of course they don't have memories of themselves, but part of the shtick of all of this, they're not newborns, right? right? It's like they have all their understanding of the world still in them. Um, so they shouldn't really be quite that naive. I feel like they kind of get away with them being a little bit more naive than, than you expect, but one other thing to note about this. So starting in this episode also, uh, Mark's sister, because we mentioned his brother-in-law, who is, of course, married to his sister. So his sister is uh, the the one family character of his that we get to meet in the outside world, yeah. outside of the office. And she's pregnant. She's about to give birth. So she goes to this birthing center, which has some strange stuff going on in it as well. Um, but there... He meets her nursemaid. Now, we saw in one of the earlier episodes that he went on a date with the nursemaid. And we mentioned in the previous episode that he even had the date did not go well. Um, He even got really defensive and went out of his way to sort of verbally attack these people passing out anti-lumen flyers, right. anti-severance flyers, right? And so, you know, no one else is this defensive about lumen. They might not care, but they're also like, why are you like yelling at them? That doesn't like that's a little much. Um, but he meets up with the nursemaid again and while here, because she is the sister, that's how they met. Uh-huh. That's how the date got set up in the first place. Um, and he, now one thing, because of everything that went on with Petey and him meeting Petey in the outside world and things, strange things going on, then Petey's passing in episode three, right. Mark has his he's be started to become more open to questioning Lumen and the severance mm-hmm. procedure because a lot has suddenly been a, he can't ignore it anymore, right? Unlike the any, which was just like this world he'd never had to think about. Literally, he couldn't think about it in a, in a certain way. He had no uh, knowledge of it. Yeah. Now he's been thinking about it. And one thing that's really interesting between the inner any and the Audi, and we really only see this predominantly from Mark's perspective, because he's the only one we follow in the outside world for any uh, amount of time, really, any, any, establish, any significant amount of time. But the more his Audi becomes open to questioning Lumen and the severance procedure, the more his any starts to do the same. Precisely. And I, I found that really interesting and curious where it took the Audi no longer uh, 
fervently trying to deny there's anything wrong with the severance procedure and fervently trying to deny that they had to consider anything about it for because then Mark was also like that weirdly naive character where he's just like, no, you just do everything the company want. That's how you get along. OK, well, we're just going to do everything by the hand. Yes. And um, nothing like he cared about the people and he would question things a little bit, but very little compared to compared to what was going on. You're like, dude, <laughs> right. Jesus, stand up for yourself. <laughs> and now as his Audi is starting to do that, the any and they have no memory. No, there's no scene. There's supposedly no going back and forth in the brain between these two severed halves but they are affecting each other seeming it really does seem yeah it uh that that made me think that at some point there is it's either an ingrained sort of regression in the severance somehow um because we do we bring up the character who uh uh, uh who handles pd's um severing um uh, not yet. Okay. Not yet. Okay. She hasn't. She hasn't even been mentioned by. I think this is the episode. She's that her name is dropped episode, for the first right. Time. That she's dropped at the end. That's right. right. Okay. So. And she shows up right. in episode six. So that's episode. right. That's right. All right. We'll save that anyway. Uh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. But I was going to say by this in, and by interacting with each other, because then they start to open up more, right? Yeah. And they start to have more by interacting with the department. Start interacting with each other. And all these characters that actually do the interacting start to become fuller human beings right. by doing so. So it's starting like the severance procedure is not <clears throat> delivering the results they want because so you can see why they kept them separate is like, even though they're severed and they're like these weirdly naive, uh, just do what the company asks versions of their Audi selves they're now becoming their own personalities, their own characters by that evolution of interacting with each other and that socialization. You know, what I find most interesting about that is, is, um, you know, like you said, they, these characters enter this world and while they aren't children, they aren't, you know, uh, infants, right. They are infants in this world. So they are crawling around and doing their best to kind of make sense of this world. And you find that these sort of disparate puzzle pieces, once you, Allow them into the same box. I, I just mixed a metaphor. Um, <laughs> I'll get back. Don't worry. You know, you know how I do it. Uh, <laughs> uh, yes, I do. We were talking about this right before we started exactly. recording. You know, you know, <laughs> the trip's always, always gets there. It's always on, on time. Yeah. Anyway. Uh, talking about our bad habits that oh, we yeah. both have to fix respectively um, <laughs> that we've noticed by <laughs> listening to these episodes once they're done. But, uh, we're like, oh, God, we're so bad at blank. But what happens is, you know, when these sort of disparate kind of puzzle pieces get together in the same proverbial box in the same space, they start making sense of each other's uh, parameters of each other's uh, uh, sort of form and figuring out what's, uh, you know, what's common, what's uh, disparate again. And they start to make sense of, you know, one, who they are within the confines of this world, which does to a certain degree illustrate um, or at least give some sort of hints to who they might be out uh, outside. And um, I'm really curious to see whether this is mirrored on the outside, whether these characters, when these characters interact on the outside, when the, the Audis interact on the outside, because I definitely think that's where it's going. Um, some of the characters are going to interact on the outside in um, uh, much more sort of uh, important ways and, yeah, it, this part just makes me excited to see the dust up. I'm excited about the chaos of where this is fucking going. <laughs> anyway, yes. A yeah. um, few more notes that I wrote down on this episode. One, man, Helly's an asshole, both Innie and Audi. Um, All right, she... you leave Helly alone. You guys, <laughs> you guys are giving Helly a hard time. But you time. know, it is interesting that when we see like the messages her Audi leaves for herself, yeah, no, but then the way Helly responds to all the people around her as well. I'm like, there is a good, like the personality. The doesn't personality is there. Exactly. Right, is exactly. there. It's like when you're a hard ass and you're like, you know, you're much more concerned with how you're feeling and what you want versus, you know, you're not even really giving like this, her any starts to in in this episode and into episode six, episode six especially, 
she starts to soften a little bit because she realizes the other people are willing, like they're doing their best. They actually do give a shit and yeah. they're trying, you know, and they're in hell the too. Not the Lumens. She, she also realizes right. that they're in hell as well. Right. Right. But it took, it takes her longer to realize this, I think, than the other people down there. Like there is an element of her personality. You get a hint of what her Audi is like mm. because of this element of her personality that is like, yeah, I don't give a shit about you. <laughs> I don't care what you think or yeah. want or say yeah. like, fuck you. I'm just doing what I want. Yeah. And then you're sort of like, damn, right. like try to be like the situation's intense for everybody, hon. Like, come on now. Yeah. Try. But yeah, she's a bit you can tell her Audi's a total asshole yeah. because you're just like, you this is <laughs> this is this is the this is the naive newborn version of this, you know, kind of a thing. And it's like it is it's pretty assholey. Um, it is. But then uh, so then uh, I also wanted to mention the quote. So at the birthing center, Mark's sister does run into this lady, she goes out for a coffee run and she kind of knocks on this door. Uh, she sees this one lady with coffee uh, that's also at the birthing center. She's in a much grander, bigger uh, She's clearly unit. wealthy. Yeah. <laughs> the yeah. She's very wealthy. She's plain and coming. And she talks to her. And th this lady, there's something about this lady that's a little weirdly vacant and checked out yeah. of the whole situation where she's kind of like half there, but also half not like, and again, you start to wonder if it's not part of like something adjacent to the severance procedure here where she's like, she's sort of like under like everything that's happening in this strange lady who came in to not ask for coffee. Yeah. She's like coffee, you, huh? <laughs> what do I think about that? Yeah. And you're just sort of like, this isn't that weird of a situation, but she's treating it like it's, but then she's not, she's also, while she seems unsure what to do, she doesn't seem afraid. Right. There's no fear. Or, there's no anything. anger or nothing. There's... Right. She just seems confused as yeah. to like, I don't make decisions. Right. Why? Uh, like, so how do I make a decision here? And at one point she, uh, the sister is asking like, Oh, is, like, is that your first? And the lady says my third. And she's like, well, how do you like, I'm terrified of this one. Like, how do you do it? And there's a quote, she says, just, she says, a uh, lot of help, I guess. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, rich people, am I right? Like a lot of help. Um, but we're going to see if that doesn't play some into something. And we are going to learn a little bit more about this we in do, episode yeah. six that we're about to jump yeah. into. Um, and the only other uh, note I have for episode five is at one point, someone says, run a 266 on Irving V, yeah. which is John Turturro's character. Yeah. And I'm like, God, they have numbers for like mm -hmm. their, like what you do. So it's again, it's like this has been going on for a while. Like there is something and there is a purpose to all of this that is, we don't know what that is. Exactly it's grinding yet, and leaning somewhere. There's inertia, there's momentum, but they're also doing a great job of hiding Easter eggs and um, sort of retarding the the flow of information which is yeah really satisfying when you compare it to a lot of the content a lot of the stuff that's you know being produced these days because they want you to just you know take it in all at once in one sitting and this is a show i just it's impossible for me to binge it was impossible for me right. to binge the show because it required and there's some um not concentration but some sort of rumination uh, to make right. sense of the sparseness of this world. And I think that's the masterstroke in this is that it's, there's this, this sparseness in not only in the character arcs, in the character motivations, in the mythos and the lore, in the actual design of uh, the production. And so it does kind of require you to kind of ruminate on, on the sort of different elements of the show, which is just, so you know, it's sad. interesting. You say the sparseness. I was just about to say something that was polar opposite of that. Mm. Um, but, but I think I think we're not saying it's not actually the polar opposite. But I was going to say the world building in this is big is more than you think. Oh yes, absolutely. Where, the, and so there's a sparseness in what's on screen at any given time, and and like every place you go, the number of characters you see is very controlled. Precisely. Like it's almost like a weirdly depopulated world in certain right. ways. It's a controlled chaos. Um, That's what I mean by the sparseness. So they're not necessarily taking, uh, uh, you know, uh, it's, I'm, I'm not going to, I don't know about controlled chaos. Chaos is too strong. of a Oh word. no, this is controlled chaos. This is controlled no. chaos. Absolutely. Absolutely. No. Controlled chaos. This is just controlled. I, I see zero chaos no. in this. How, how could it so not be chaos? This is... I mean, okay, let me ask you this. How could it... What do you think the motivations are behind Cobell's emotion? Behind her freaking out? Behind 
uh, uh, Helly's interest in and deep desire to kind of escape this world behind Mark's sort of confusion uh, behind all the characters. There is a chaos. That's what I'm saying. There's a there's an underlying chaos, and it comes. It's motivated by different things for each character. But there's an underlying chaos that within the confines of this world, which is so metered, they're having to control it. They're having to control the chaos the moment they step into this office. They're having to control the chaos that's going on in their minds and their emotions at every turn. And we, you know, we kind of we kind of see with Helly when she's initially dropped into the world, she isn't accustomed to having to control that chaos, for lack of a better phrase. And so that kind of chaos just comes out at every turn. That's why she was trying the, the, the sort of the parameters and the, the barriers and trying to sort of escape and trying to, you know, dig into and express the chaos of even if it's sort of a mortal or existential chaos at that point. So that's what I mean by sort of controlled yeah. chaos. I, I mean more of the motivation that. behind the that, characters. But I- I get that, but I don't think chaos is the right word because chaos is a lot. Chaos is huge. Chaos is yeah. everything. And it's, yeah, but no. Yeah. See, I can't agree with that, yeah. even a little bit. It, it, the chaos of the characters who, uh, of let's say, Helly, for instance. I get it. I get it. I just don't agree. World. She's dropped into this world where she knows nothing of the physics of this world, of the motivation of this world, of its people. Mm-hmm. Anything. That's not chaos. That's absolutely That's not chaos. chaos. That's chaos. The chaos yep. is driving her. The chaos within her emotions, within her intellect, is driving her to try and escape and flee, even to the point of death. That's chaos. sure, but that that is a singular drive. That's not chaos. That's 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 emotional chaos. That is absolutely emotional uh, chaos. No, it's an emotion. That's there's emo- emotion and there's a em- stop. There, stop, no, stop. There's, that there's is emotional emotion. chaos. That is emotional chaos. Dallas. No, yes, it is not. It is. Emotional it is. chaos is far more chaotic. Than what that. is emotional that chaos? Is, that is linear and no. it is singular and no. it is it is powerful, it's but not it ain't singular. chaos. It's not singular. She's not feeling one single emotion in that time. That is not a single no, yeah. emotion. For the most part. No, she's uh, not uh, look, singing one, yes. one single emotion. Yes, as much as anyone can, no. yes. No. You're not dropped into yes. a world where you know nothing. You're forced to stay there. The rules that of physics don't apply and th- that is not a singular case that's not a the singular rules case. rules of physics do apply the rules of the physics world, don't rules apply. Of physics do apply how she she, she killed herself oops did we cover cover that yet oh <laughs> no but and she didn't technically right she tried right but my point is- and she and <clears throat> she tried in one of the earlier episodes when she tried to uh oh no 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 she didn't cut her wrist she she drew messages on her when she was in the bathroom i thought that's what she was doing i did too uh, actually she, i think she, did that yeah, in yeah, purpose yeah. and then she wrote then she wrote the message on her arm because it was in red I know. and so i was like oh those are all cuts on her arm I, I, I see, what's, what's, what's the best part at the end of this the, the best part about that okay, hold, hold on hold on let me go back to that point the best part okay. about that scene was when they did it, and it was in red. I physically sat up. I was like, oh, "Is she cutting her wrist?" It was such a such a stimulating moment. Anyway, go. Okay. So at the end of this episode, and it's beautifully, I believe it's this episode mm. that she winds up hanging herself at the very end, or maybe it's the end of episode five, and then this is the one where they rescue five, her yeah. at the beginning of yeah, episode yeah, yeah. six. Okay. So uh, so we failed to mention that, but that's kind of the cliffhanger of episode five. Yeah. Is that Helly? And again, uh, so. Uh, Again, this is all directed by Ify McArdle. And one thing I didn't mm. want to mention about Ify McArdle versus Ben Stiller's direction that I think I think this shines through in these three particular episodes. Ify McArdle seems to be much more of a thriller style director. Like right? she's got this ability. Like things are much darker in these really? episodes, in this noirish thriller born identity almost kind of way the scenes in the outside world are suddenly like drenched in shadow not just darkness shadow and silhouettes and you get this noirish thriller feel that was a little bit present in episodes one through three but she takes it to the next level and and maybe you Um, know i to your point uh it may have been just where it fits in the narrative and the story um but either way you come Either away. Way, I still think she, you, I, I come away with first of all wanting to see her direct uh, um, a thriller, a film. Like I, I want to see mm-hmm. her thriller. I need to see it. Like because what she manages to do in these what fifty minute episodes 
We got five. What was it four, five? But and three six. of them back to back. But three of them back, to, back, back to back. So, so she has micro arts mm-hmm. for sure. So she has the opportunity to kind of direct, and maybe that's why it. I was going to say this is this is like her two hour thriller it altogether, is. right? You know, right. so yeah, she yeah. gets the chance to kind of play with these characters and these arcs and this momentum and this inertia for mm-hmm. three hours almost. And what she does, right. to your point, is so it's it's masterful. Like the the yeah. you know you mentioned the shadows, the sort of you know, she does this weird thing in episode, what was it? Episode, oh, with the map. There's a moment when they, when they have the map, they're trying to recreate the map, I think. Um, yeah, they're trying to recreate mm-hmm. the map. And something happens where the paper falls or something, and then you're able to see it again. But it kind of goes out of focus. Maybe that was just a... a uh, uh, a flub, but it made me sort of sit in and take in the map even more. Anyway, she's fantastic. Yeah. Um, these three episodes, this micro arc, mini arc in the middle of this series, hi, it ramps up the stakes uh, so much. Uh, and it's also, it's also really delicate like it everything about it is really delicate you mentioned the sort of born identity kind of nature of her arc here and even with that kind of kinetic energy it's still really delicate i'm i'm feeling more for the characters in this arc now even as she kind of lays bare a lot of their kind of bullshit for lack of a better term anyway um Mm -hmm. yeah and I also wanted to mention, you know, we mentioned how it was all women writers on these. So we should actually mention who they are oh, because yeah. that would be a That's disservice a otherwise. So Carrie Drake, K-A-R-I Drake, uh, wrote episode four. Mm-hmm. Uh, she has also written on, um, let's see, the TV shows The Lottery, Defiance, Limitless, Insatiable, okay. The Dark Crystal, Age of Resistance, Lost in Space, then Severance. And now she has also written for Tales of the Walking Dead. Mm-hmm. Uh, on top of that. And then episode five, the one we're on right now, Amanda Overton wrote it. And she has also written for, um, let's see, as a writer. Oh, no. She's been I a script think, supervisor. Uh, I think Anna O'Young Minch wrote five, right? Is she the one who wrote? I thought she wrote six. Uh, oh, no, you're right. Anna. Okay, you're yeah. right. Amanda Overton wrote six. Okay, so Anna O'Young Mensch wrote five. Yeah. And she's actually the only one who comes back for season two okay. of these three writers. Okay, she's written plays, apparently. So Anna O'Young Mensch is an award winning playwright and screenwriter. Her plays have been produced at Williamstown Theater Festival, NAATCO slash The Public Theater, right. The Geffen Playhouse, and Playwrights Realm, East West Players, Interact Theater, Theater Moo, cool. and many other theaters across the country and the world. So this is where she's coming from and why, yeah. um, as a screenwriter, she's new, uh, or at least as right. far as like shit that got made. <laughs> right. Right. Who knows? Right. Um, who knows? As, as far as something where she got an IMDb credit right. that's there and it's right. li- uh, and not IMDb Pro, right. just IMDb. She, she could be a working writer for twenty years, and this is just her first exactly. IMDb credit. Yeah. And it does say she is a supervising producer on Severance okay. and a co-executive producer on The White Darkness, both on Apple TV Plus. Anna was a member of the pilot cohort. Ah, Anna was a member of the pilot cohort of the Warner Media Access Showrunner oh, program. Yeah. So that seems okay. to be maybe how she her little entryway into that. Um, but but uh, so she wrote episode five, and then we're going to get to Amanda Overton, who wrote episode six. Uh, and Amanda Overton has been a script coordinator, and then as a writer, she has written for it looks like Edge of Normal TV uh, series, True Blood, Jessica's Blog. Arcane, the animated show, yeah. and um, Monarch, the Monster Godzilla Earth. show, yeah, Legacy of Monsters. Yeah, yeah. yeah. All right. So now, first off, I, you're not getting the last word on that. I do have to. I did, did not get to state my case about the controlled chaos. Yeah. So I do want to go back. Go we don't have to like argue, argue this, but just to state my side of this a little bit more clearly. Controlled chaos is a phrase often used to ca- casually to describe something that looks out of control, but which functions according to unseen rules or organization. And that's the point. Speed Racer is controlled chaos, the movie. That is what the meaning of controlled chaos is. It is complete visual chaoticness or 
even the way it's executed, hmm. it's like it's shit's happening left and right and flying at you. And you're like, you can't even tell what like you would need to go slow and break down how it's even doing what it's doing, because so much is flying all over the place. And yet it functions as a piece because the filmmakers were that was our whole point of when we talked about it on that episode our our, our debut episode folks go check it out yeah go check uh, that out guys. and movies speed racer <laughs> 2008 the wachowskis it's a hoot. but the wachowskis when yeah the wachowskis when they made that movie were making a controlled chaos movie it was a very tightly wound perfectly put together but in a way that looks and seems and feels like chaos that's the meaning of controlled chaos now even if even taking that meaning and trying to give it a different meaning, which is fine, that's always, you know, human beings are allowed um, to do to to uh, translate that in another way or give it a new spin. But I just think chaos is a word where even yes, the emotions are there. They're burgeoning within these characters they are bubbling under the surface. But chaos requires there to be like, I don't, I cannot see this as like, they're feeling every emotion under the sun at the same time. And it's like, no, they're not. Dave, they're... The... <laughs> I, I get, I understand. I, I know the definition of controlled chaos. And what I'm saying is the way this world is presented, it is chaotic. Nope. It is absolutely nope. chaotic to the viewer. Not even a little it bit. It is chaotic. It's chaotic. Dallas. You're having Dallas. To, Everything you're about having the, way, the way, the way, of, the way, the way, the way. No, no, no. Make sense of all nope. the disparate nope. elements nope. and narratives and points that are going on simultaneously, not only inside but outside. Not only the the processes that are happening in the office, but the processes that are happening within each individual. I'm not saying over the, the chaos, course of hours. I'm not saying that there's nothing chaotic about of that. Of course. It's chaotic. Of course, it's chaotic. No, nope. it's chaotic. Dallas, chaotic. the presentation of this world is so perfectly dominoes falling at the pace the writers want them to fall, slowly, gradually. Mm -hmm. There's zero things chaotic about the presentation of this oh, world. No, it's chaos. Zero. It's chaos. It's chaos. Yeah. It's chaos. Okay. It's chaos. The way this world is presented is very careful. Um, the thing I was going to say that was the opposite of what you said earlier is that the world building is more in depth and significant than you think, because those early episodes, you're very focused on just the office and the home life of generally only of Mark too. Huh. Then you meet like his sister and his brother-in-law. And that's really it. That, like, that is the, the world of this world. And then you only slowly pull out, like we're about to discuss episode six, Hide and Seek, written by Amanda Overton. Now we're there. <laughs> and episode six, uh, you start to, then we start to see that the lady that, the, that his sisters uh, met at the birthing center um, is the wife of a senator. And that the senator has a background in um, pushing severance as a legal procedure and, and helping it get legalized. Wait, wait, wait. Um, was, and then we, was this senator the same senator from... They mentioned in episode one. I'm, I'm just making this connection. Hold on. Sorry. Beats sorry. Me. Keep talking. Keep talking. I'm looking this up. Mm -hmm. um, so the senator and then the sister starts looking up news articles and the news articles start to break down that he was one of the primary defenders of severance and, and um, one of the, the big vocal, the mouthpieces to get it legalized. Mm -hmm. And probably this wife of his, whoever she is and how she's being uh, you know, uh, she's even on record, too, is saying, oh, so I wrote down um, one thing that's really interesting is that the sister meets up with the wife of the senator outside the birthing center again. Right. Mm -hmm. um, well, sort of outdoor at the birthing center grounds, but outdoors with the senator. Now she that's who she, that's how she looks up. The senator. The park, she right. sees who the guy yeah. is. And he's a little weird because he's like, oh. You met my wife. Okay, we got to go now. And, you know, she's like, oh, that was weird. But then the wife also acts like she has no idea who the sister is. Yeah. And she looks at her. And then when the sister's like, we met in there. And then the wife's like, oh, okay. <laughs> and it's like that thing where it's like, you do not remember who this person is, but they swear you're old. You know, you met like three yeah. years ago or something like that at this film festival somewhere. And you're like, 
uh, okay, yeah. <laughs> and you're like, oh, Jesus, you, I know you don't remember me. Um, so it was so blatant. She didn't remember her, but it was last night. So this is, again, that like weird, I wonder if there's a severance in the yes. wife yes. where it's like whoever was there last right. night was a the one half of the brain and then the person there during the day with right. and here's the thing with or without the senator right? right when the senator isn't present she's someone else and when the present senator is present she's another person right. part of her brain something like that is going on here um plainly I'm and the- so yeah go ahead uh sorry i just found it and i lost it again god damn it go on <laughs> So uh, another thing, so when she's looking up the newspaper articles, so the wife is even like on quoted in the article as saying something about um, the severance and Lumen and, and like how, how, oh, no, no, no. She's just on, it's like this weird homemaker thing where she's like, oh yeah, all the renovations oh, we oh, have yes. to our house, our big mansion yes, of a house. Yes, yes. And like, it's such a non, a, a useless throwaway quote that you're just like, you know, she's Susie Homemaker and uh, seemingly nothing else. <laughs> nothing else. Like her whole yeah. personality. Yeah. Um, but. Senator is from the hometown of Kier. The hometown is named Kier, Kier. right? Mm-hmm. Um, so, and it, and then at one point, I also have it written down as a note on this episode: illumination beyond all is apparently an Egan philosophy. Don't forget, lumen is a play on the word of luminosity, luminosity. which is all about illumination and light and yada yada. Um, so illumination, which is again that weird thing where we like that the first edition of the handbook and how this entire version Mm -hmm. of what Egan Mm -hmm. and Lumen was all about seems to have been twisted over time. Mm -hmm. And as it's gone on, and maybe it's not really about what it was originally about, we'll see. Um, And then the thing I wanted to mention about Cobell is this is the episode where we see her shrine to Kier. And we see in that shrine, (laughs) it's a literal shrine (laughs) that she worships at. And she prays to Kier. She literally prays to him. And... We see a picture of her as like a Girl Scout yeah. style uh, believer in Kier at an at a uni- at a school, yeah. uh, an institute where she was schooled at, which was a Kier Lumen, Lumen Institute. institute. Exactly, a pipeline, right. a pipeline essentially. Yeah. Right. So she is literally a brainwashed true believer, Mormon slash Scientologist, whatever you want to call it. Like she is that kind of person, which is why I think. One, which is why, and pro- po- probably Milchek is as well, which is why these people are almost sycophantic and weirdly brainwashed, like, you know, brainwashed in their own way, not like severed people, mm-hmm. but brainwashed in this way of just like, we are good soldiers, right. good Christian soldiers and marching to the beat, um, doing what we need to do. But Cobell is interesting because she's such a true believer in a, and she worships Kira so much. On the one hand, I think she really wants to be like, she wants to be a chosen one, of course. right? She wants, she wants to be to the one the to change Absolutely. everything. Yeah. Right. <clears throat> yeah, right. For sure. So she's opposed and she is somewhat dismissive of the board who is actually the board because she doesn't like them because they're above her and she does not believe they should be above her. So she has her own. Um, she's a true believer, but unlike Milchek, who is a true believer in the system, I think as well, mm. Cobell is not a true believer in the system. She's a true believer in her own dedication to Kier as a godlike figure. Right. So, so here, so here, here's an interesting point because I, I sort of had the same thought process. It made me um, using that Scientology sort of parallel, right, or any sort of religiosity, right. Um, you have the true sort of devotees who have bought into, uh, you know, the, the, the sort of deity for lack of a better term. And that's, that was the most interesting part about that episode for me was that that question was still unanswered for me because I don't know for sure uh, whether or not she is truly anti-board because she hates the idea of this being an institution that's corporate somehow and she wants to get back to some sort of rudimentary connection to Kier. Uh, I don't know. But one yeah. other thing. Um, in this episode, we get... <laughs> uh, so there's a character called Dylan, um, which is the most lovable character, I think, in the core. <laughs> um, kind of. Again, lovable is a stretch yeah. of a word. But in, but, context, um... in, in context, at least, <laughs> he's the most, you know, it's the most, okay, let me pinch your cheeks uh, uh, kind of character. But we have a moment. Or slap him. <laughs> a lot of times you want to slap him. Uh, leave that guy alone. Uh, <laughs> but 
what ends up happening, um, how much can I say without giving this away? Uh, there's a scenario where Milchek has to engage with Dylan's Audi. Right. Audi. And he does in yes. the outside and world. And he does in the outside world. And it's the first time that Dylan or any of these we characters. We see that they can, yes. And we see that they can turn the any on Precisely. in the outside Precisely. world. They do not have to be in the workplace. That's the most important he, a bit of information from yes. the from this this, this yes. scenario, for sure. Yes. Milchek shows up at Dylan's, Dylan's is Audi's yeah. house. Um, and then like does something, like says something and boom. Right. Uh, the severance the is broken. Any of Dylan, right. right? Well, no, well, no. The severance turns on in a turns. way. It's not broken. Oh, right, um, right, right, right. It he it switches it from one right, side to the right, other. Right right. right, 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 right. And he's like, now you're the any version, even though you're on the outside world. We can do. We have a remote <laughs> right. control way of flipping you between your two selves anytime we want, right. which I'm pretty sure no one is. <laughs> no aware one's aware. Of yeah, if they're the which is why player. it's such an interesting plot point. And uh... although uh, no, I shouldn't say that because actually. Actually, Dylan, at the end of that scene, um, they turn the Audi back on right. and Dylan looks right at Milchek right and says, Milchek. so are we done That's here? That's right. And he's like, yeah. So Dylan knows he switched Dylan to the knows. innie, talked to the Zinni, and then came back. So they do know. Or and Mark doesn't know this, though, I'm pretty sure. Not through first hand uh, experience. Though we'll we'll right. find out. He, you know. Yeah. He he really he, he understands Petey's, you know, the situation, but not first hand. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, anyway. Things we're gonna lo look at in the final three episodes. We're already uh running over time, so let's get to the wine pairings. Dallas, have you changed your wine pairing for episodes four through six? <sighs> Having no, actually, no, I haven't. <laughs> I I I did, but I didn't, and I'll tell you why. <laughs> so I'm sticking with the first one for uh, episodes uh, f uh, four and five. But for the sixth episode, I did decide to curate a separate glass. I needed something with a... So I guess technically I, there is an, an upgrade in or an evolution in the pairing. Um, I needed something with a... Something a bit sandier, if that makes sense. <laughs> um uh, I needed something that had a bit more bite that, you know, made me a little, a little confused, but also satisfied. Um, so I knew I wanted to go with something sort of uh, a Sicilian, which, you know, those guys, they stand up, they're very old grapes. Um, and I went with a pure Paracone. Um, and it is the No Tricks Paracone uh, uh, 2021. Um, it has a great bite. It uh, it's a little. Um, it's very, very, vib uh, very vibrant. It's um, it doesn't need anything else. Uh, and I think these three episodes, this these uh, three episodes in this arc, particularly episode six, um, is the best episode so far, without question. Um, I don't know if that's just uh, attributed to the kind of inertia of the first act those first three episodes um and the story kind of opening up uh or if it's attributed to uh Efe's, um sort of master stroke here with contr controlling the chaos yeah i said it uh but yeah i went with um for the first two uh, episodes of this second series um i went with uh, what I chose before. And for episode three, I went with the No Tricks Paracone, uh, Terra Sicili uh, Siciliana 2021. Um, price point, uh, I got this guy for, I think, 30? 29 or 30, but you can pick it up a little cheaper. Um, it's the hand, the grapes are, are sort of their. It's a. Uh, I'm, I'm going to fumble all of this, so luckily edit, Dave can edit all this out and make Thanks. it. Sound. <laughs> I already got to edit out our whole controlled chaos debate. That went on way too long. Oh my lord, folks! You have no idea. It went on so long. I cut out a lot of it for you. Trust me. No one wants an uncut version of this episode. I don't want an uncut version of this episode. It went on so long, but I made sure both of our primary arguments were here in this episode. But hey. 
comment on our Substack or email us in at wine, the letter N, P-O-D, at gmail.com. Let us know what you think. Is this controlled chaos? Am I right and it's not and that's not the definition? Or is Dallas using poetic license the way he should and it absolutely is? Let us know. <laughs> Um, anyway, it is a uh, medium-bodied uh, red, lively ruby color, violet sometimes you get. Um, curious thing about this, it does have a, not a weird, an odd um, geranium kind of note that is pretty prominent. Um, uh, you get all the herbs, um, there's some anise, some ginger. It's really interesting, really dynamic. And it's sandy in texture in terms of the tannins. Um, uh, yeah, I've, I really enjoy it. Um, it, it. It's an acquired taste, I think, for people who are not fans of um, the Paracone uh, grape and that variety. Um, but, yeah. And I'm sh so many people know if they are or not. That's a problem. Oh, no. <laughs> like, probably no one knows. <laughs> or very well, few if you don't, know. go try it and Am tell I us. Am I a fan of the Paracone yeah. grape? <laughs> and if you, if you don't know, go try it and tell us, you know? Yes. Um, yes. But, yeah. Definitely try. Try all these grapes, guys, because uh, <laughs> you can surprise yourself, honestly. Absolutely. Um, and there's so much variety out there these days. Be brave. If it's a grape you've never heard of before, amazing. Yeah. That is exactly the thing you should go out there and try. And let us know. Um, now, yes. Now, speaking of grapes you have heard of, likely, um, or at least most of you, though, there, if you're if you're a non-wine drinker, if you truly are brand new to wine, maybe not, maybe not. Um, but Dallas, this is actually a grape you dropped uh, the last episode that we talked about episodes one through three, um, and that is Cabernet Franc. Oh, yeah. And so I took your advice and... Uh, <laughs> I decided now I you don't have to change. I still stand by my Retsina mm. uh, from the previous episode, which is that yeah. Greek white wine with pine resin mm -hmm. added. It's like an alien made wine. <laughs> it keeps you off kilter. Um, it's not unpleasant, but it also isn't. I'm not sure I can say it's pleasant <laughs> either. It's somewhere in between. Um, and I'm sure you can develop the palate for yeah. it. That was my first bottle of Retsina ever. So there might come a time if I kept drinking it, if I keep going back and buying bottles, and I definitely will uh, somewhere in the future. Like maybe it doesn't, maybe it's not even that off-putting anymore. Like mm. it's no longer the alien wine. Um, but for now, if you haven't had Retsina, if it's not a daily, it's a daily drinker in Greece. Um, but if you're not in, from Greece, you know, it's like uh, how you feel about Vegemite and things like that. If, you're, <laughs> right. if you didn't grow up with it, um, it's one of those things where you're like, yeah, I'm good. I'm good. I'm, I don't know about this. But you mentioned Cabernet Franc, and I definitely think Cabernet Franc, especially from a cool climate. Yeah. So I have a Cabernet Franc from the Finger Lakes from New York. Oh, yeah. uh, so this is a uh, do, 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 Red Newt Cellars Red Cabernet Franc from Glacier Ridge Vineyard 2019. Okay. And this is a, you know, Finger Lakes, New York, mm -hmm. very cool, uh, relatively and cold climate. So Cabernet Franc already is a little bit, it's one of the parent grapes of Cabernet Sauvignon, mm -hmm. but it, it's much lighter in color, body, higher acidity. You get some astringency with it a lot of the times, like a green bell pepper astringency that can sometimes come through. Which is and one of my favorite notes went out of the Cab Franc. Same, it is, I same, love same. it when it's expressed. I prefer a Cab Franc over Cabernet Sauvignon most of the time. Oh, um, for that reason, it has these layers and this, this complexity that, that Cabernet Sauvignon tends to be a bit more streamlined. Mm. Cabernet Sauvignon, you can make richer, and then if you oak it and and if it's right, if it's in the right climate, it's from you're giving it the right uh, aging techniques like it really can also be an amazing experience. But Cabernet Franc, you can drink it younger and it's just it's already so much interest, so much it's more interesting uh, most of the time. Yeah. Um, so this from the Finger Lakes and from the Glacier Ridge has this sort of even the, the wine, the winery says the Glacier Ridge Cabernet Francs have this earthy, smoky quality that um, is really interesting and really pleasant and that gives it yet another dimension, especially with these noir thriller episodes coming into there. I like that earthy, smoky quality. I thought added like a really yeah. nice match like for those. And then it's like cooler climate cab franc you're always you're not going to get ripe fruit from cooler climate red wines mm. you're going to get underripe fruit and so you get instead of like strawberries you get this like strawberries that are still a little crunchy mm. you know what i mean like it's still it's still it's not that fruit forward it's got a little bit of fruitiness but it's like this underripe fruitiness yeah. with this bit of bitterness and smoky earthiness and that astringency 
Um, so all together though, and again, it's well made. The acidity is high, so it's got that nice little like citric acidity that's a part of it. Um, it is just, and even at 2019, like you, this is made to be drunk young. So I think I think the acidity will allow it to age really, really well. But you can drink it right now. It was, it had the right kind of bittersweet, mm. underripe fruitness earthy smokiness yeah. and astringency all together match the flavor of these episodes to a tea. you can even do this one for the first few if you're like no ritzina for me thank you <laughs> um i'm just going to move on to something more pleasant this is the more pleasant version where it'll still challenge you a little bit if you're new to wine um and if you're not if you like that type of subtlety and nuance like yeah this is the one for you i and cool. definitely the one for me cool yeah i totally see that 100%. all right folks Beautiful, guys. This has been this has been another three episodes of Severance. We will be back in one week for the final three Woo! episodes, seven through nine, um, where we see how this all wraps up, and then we'll be prepped and ready to go for whenever season two drops. So once again, <laughs> this has been another wine, and we will be back next week for another wine and entertainment pairing for your entertainment. See you then, and bye-bye. Bye-bye, guys. Bye.